That's a new thing. Good morning, everyone. Come on in. Rusty, turn on the lights, please. That's it. More, more. Brighter. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's good. It's good. It's good to come in an hour early, isn't it? All right, let's have some announcements here. The few and the faithful have braved the storm. You're all Canadians at heart, that's good. A couple of announcements before we, uh, before we begin. Yeah, I don't take them after though. Yeah. Uh, I think this is still good for today. Uh, she may be here tonight. Uh, Barbara Brandon, one of our uh, newer members, Bud Brandon's wife, she's going to be taking blank fit, uh, blankets and, and other children's clothing and accessories to the Infant Crisis Center this week. So if you have any baby blankets or articles of clothing, um, from infant to four-year-old, I think that's the, the age group there, from infant to four-year-old that are laundered and would like to donate them, please bring them uh, by this evening. So you can leave them out in front of the office there. Uh, also, uh, announcement uh, Friday, February the 7th, was supposed to be the uh, game day for the ladies in the annex, and that's been canceled uh, until further notice. Uh, another activity on Friday, February the 7th, that will continue to go on will be the Titus II ladies. We'll meet in the uh, Titus II room in the annex for the second part of the video series, uh, You'll Get Through, and that's at 6.30 p.m., this coming Friday, the 7th. Also on uh, Saturday the 8th, the teens are invited to a movie night at the Perkins home. The movie will start at 7 p.m. Boys are asked to bring drinks, girls uh, to bring snacks. If you need information, the Perkins are here today and you can ask them and get more information. Also, uh, a little further out, um, uh, Sunday, February the <clears throat> 16th, uh, there'll be a shower for Christy, uh, I can't pronounce it, Krempich? Krimpke. Krimpke. Really, with a G-E-S, it's Krimpke. Okay. 
So Christy Krimke, and who is going to be the future Mrs. McAllister, and that'll be here in the building from two to four in the afternoon. The couple is registered at Bed Bath and Beyond, as well as Target. If you have more information or need some, you can just see Jeannie Aldridge, and she's here today. That's Sunday, February the 16th for the shower. Also, the next mail out with love from Choctaw will be Sunday, February the 9th. That's next Sunday. The lists are already up on the sign up board. You know what to do with those things. Uh, if you'd like to donate some postage instead of goods, you can also do that. If you have more information, please see Lee's Mazalongo or place it in the office folder. Uh, also, a new thing here, all parents of children in grades 3 to 12 are encouraged to stop at the table in the foyer to get more information on EPIC. EPIC is the acronym for Ever Present in Christ, EPIC. There's a sign-up sheet for the events as well as just basic information. If you have any questions, see Bonnie Bella, she's here, or Celestia. And EPIC is, uh, isn't that LTC, Leadership Training for Christ? Isn't that uh, same thing? It's replacing LTC, and I think the big difference is it's going to be here in town instead of having to drive the, you know, all the way to Tulsa or Kansas or whatever. They're trying to start that program here in Oklahoma City. Same idea, however. So that's what that EPIC sign-up uh, uh, not on the board actually, it's a table out there and they have information. I think I've announced that the game day is over and uh, one other, one other uh, announcement here that was given, uh, Laquita Cook, Alan's wife, was named uh, Choctaw N Nakoma Park Teacher of the Year. Isn't that wonderful, huh? <laughs> Amen. Honor, on, as the Bible said, honor those to whom honor is due. So that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, achievement and also a wonderful um, uh, a wonderful witness, uh, Laquita. Fabulous. All right, we begin with our song service. Brother Harold will come up now. One forty-four will be our first song. You need to use a book. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Next song will be 113. It'll be the song before we have the, the Lord's Supper. Brother John Dillinger will be leading us in that this morning. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father and it thrills my soul just to know and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me. And will last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy 
in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me mountains and brighter than the sun it was offered at Calvary for everyone greatest of treasures and it's mine today though my sin were as scarlet he has washed them away his grace reaches me yes his grace reaches me and will last He sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The very son of God became flesh and came to earth and eventually returned to heaven after his crucifixion. And for that we are sorry, but we come here today to commemorate his death burial, but more importantly, his resurrection. Before he went to the cross, he commanded us, as well as those who were with him, to take and eat the unleavened bread, to take and to drink the cup, and as often as ye do it, do it in remembrance of him. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that your love for us was so great that you sent your Son to die for us. We are saddened for the fact that he had to go through what he went through on our behalf. But we are overjoyed with his glorious resurrection and the hope that we have through that very miraculous we now partake of this bread that represents his body. Father, we pray that we do this in a manner that is pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told his disciples to do this and as often as ye do in remembrance of me. It almost brings to mind that we do not, or I, perhaps we cannot begin to understand the importance of what we are now doing. God the Father is with us at all times where two or more are gathered in his name. And his Holy Spirit lives within us as his children. And Jesus is represented by the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Isn't it just amazing that we are the catalyst that brings those three together? And we are honored to be part of that union. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are so grateful for the gift of your son. Again, saddened that he had to shed his blood. But we are again so grateful for his glorious resurrection. And as he commanded his disciples at the beginning and at the very end of his time, for when his hour had come, we too are obedient to partaking this fruit of the vine that is his blood. May we do this in a manner that is pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, this is a time in which we should be encouraged to give of our means. Give as we prosper, we're told. Well, may we learn to prosper more, that we can give more, because we will never outgive our Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with. For all our gifts and our talents, our skills. For a measure of faith that is within us and for your unending grace. As well as the forgiveness of our sins. Father, now as we give back to you a portion of that which you have blessed us with. Bless those, Father, who have the oversight of these funds. And we pray that your divine providence be that it be used in a way that will bring glory and honor to you, that it will strengthen your church, that it will further your church, and that it will reach out to 
to the lost who need you so much. Thank you, Father, for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Next song will be number 800 if you need to use the book. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Dusty Roberts, those of you uh, may already know, some of you, uh, says thank you for the uh, prayers. Dusty was released from the hospital last night and uh, told to rest. He had a, an extremely dire or serious asthma attack, had to, had to be rushed to the hospital. Uh, uh, from Bonnie Galbraith, one of our newer members here, uh, she uh, is having surgery Tuesday the 4th at uh, Midwest Regional Hospital, and that's going to be a knee replacement, and uh, request prayers uh, for a speedy recovery, and uh, and to pray for the doctors and staff. That's always a good thing, just in case they don't know everything. Okay. Uh, Boyd Mize has a couple of cards. One uh, for himself. He's having a biopsy this coming Wednesday, and he asks us to pray for good results from that. It's for Boyd Mize. And also for his son, Darren. Uh, says uh, Darren's facing a life change decision, changing decision, and please pray for divine guidance. Okay. That's for Darren Mize. Uh, Brenda Young, you may have heard last week, had a wreck, and she's having uh, vertigo problems. And uh, so we need to pray for uh, Brenda and her recovery. No fun being dizzy, is it? No. And then uh, from Gail Morgan, on a happier note, uh, she says, uh, prayer of thanksgiving, Calvin made it to 70 years old. <laughs> that must be some kind of miracle, I don't know. But. 
anyway, it says happy day. Uh, we, we, we are glad you're here, Calvin, still. Okay. I'd also like to mention uh, some that are on our list already, uh, and I know you can read some of those, but uh, Karen, Carolyn Bentley still struggling with uh, an, infe an infection on her uh, surgery, surgical site, and uh, trying to recover from that. Uh, Joyce Pickle, of course, with the loss of Carl and uh, some struggles with that, but she's got some upcoming testing as well. Uh, Veronica Clifton, one of our uh, shut-ins, uh, has double pneumonia, and uh, she's in Midwest City Regional. Uh, Mary Coffey has been uh, out of pocket and in the hospital and uh, rehabilitating as well uh, for a couple of weeks or so, and uh, she gets to come home tomorrow, I understand. That's Mary Coffey. And uh, you know of Jim McRae and uh, PJ, of course, uh, you know, is really struggling with uh, uh, his back cancer and uh, she had some back issues as well but uh, really been through it and he's got several uh, chemo treatments uh, left I know uh, Chuck was telling me he was had a long talk with them yesterday and it's just you know they've been fighting this for quite a while and just need our prayers Becky Mosshammer got made it home uh, and she's home recovering from what should have been not a real serious surgery <laughs> but became interesting with some of the uh, I guess a miscue, I'll, I'll call it. Anyway, uh, but she's home recovering now. And then uh, Chris Westland, uh, serious uh, battle with cancer as well. Let's, uh, let's remember those in our prayers, okay? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for, uh, for caring for us down to this very moment. And uh, we, we thank you for this family, uh, this congregation here of Christians, Father, and the love that... Uh, we show to each other, and we pray that you'd bless us in, the, in that caring and that loving. Uh, we pray that you'd be with each uh, family that we mention, Father, each name, each family, and that you'll be with the doctors that are caring for them, that you will uh, assist them in areas where they don't know, Father. And uh, uh, we always pray for the best for, the, for these individuals, uh, uh, even when we don't know what that is. But we trust you, Father, and for uh, uh, good or ill, uh, we, we accept uh, uh, your guidance. We accept your word, Father, and your say. Uh, but we do hope, Father, for, I guess, for our own benefit that uh, uh, these folks can recover and uh, be back with us and uh, uh, lead normal lives again if it's your will. We do uh, Thank you for the health that uh, most of us have and the, and the recoveries that many of us have had from various ailments. And we know if we have others that are struggling with different things as well. And we pray that you'd be with those, uh, Father, and uh, just bless them and uh, with the suffering that they, they, they may be going through. And uh, help us always, Father, to turn to you. Help us to uh, turn our hearts to you, Father, and uh, uh, be open to your plans for us in our lives. Uh, bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Next song will be 417. I might say to you that there's not going to be any children's Bible time today. And after we sing this song, Brother Rich DeBoard will be our scripture reading this morning. 417. Sweet is the promise, it shined is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see, he the great example is the pattern for me. Wherever he leads out the Yeah. 
scripture reading this morning will be from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 21 through 24, if you'd like to follow along. Again, John, chapter 8, verses 21 through 24. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, Where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, and if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. morning. Beautiful morning, huh? All right. I love this kind of weather. Anybody else? Not too many. Okay, a few hands raised. All right. But kindred spirits. This lesson is one, uh, I'm, I'm sure you can relate to it if you've been a member of the Church of Christ for very long at all, because this is a reoccurring thing that comes up. It comes up on a regular basis and it comes up often. I hear the question and I have discussed it with several members of the church about people who point the finger at us and say, you guys, you think you're the only ones going to heaven, don't you? Anybody ever had someone say that to you and say it in kind of a negative way? Now the funny thing about it is, I know a lot of Baptists who think that they're the only ones going to heaven, but nobody ever says that about the Baptists. I know some Catholics who think We think that too, but nobody ever says that about the Catholic Church. Why is that reserved for us? I think one of the reasons is because we're the ones that got it right. But here's here's the deal. Are we the only ones going to heaven? That's the question. I want to answer this with Scripture because if you answer it with anything besides Scripture, then the answer is not worth anything. Amen? Amen? So let's take a look and see what Jesus says. Now this text that Rich read for us just a minute ago is, is the first one I want us to consider together in talking about do we think we're the only ones going to heaven? Jesus said very clearly, verse 24, we won't read the whole text again because Rich did just read it for us, but if you look at verse 24, it says Jesus is speaking here. And he said, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You know how Jesus was. A lot of times he said things. You couldn't really understand much what he was saying, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm being facetious here. That's pretty plain. Could he have said it more clearly? Unless... Someone believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die in their sins. Now, you can't candy coat that. You shouldn't candy coat that. You can't sugar coat that. You can't make that sound good. Anybody who does not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God is going to do what? Die in their sins. Who said that? Marty Kessler? Oh, no. Rich DeBoard said it. He, he read it first. 
But why did he read it? Because it was there from the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we being narrow-minded when we tell people, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you're going to die in your sins? Is that narrow-minded or is that accurate? We look at people who forecast the weather, bless their hearts, one to three inches. I think there were four inches on the ground 30 minutes ago. <laughs> They're just trying to get it right, but, but they have to look at everything and try to figure out what's going to happen. We don't have to figure anything out. All we have to do is look at the book. And Jesus says, except you believe that I'm he, you're going to die in your sins. People say, what if I don't believe in Jesus? You're going to die in your sins. Do you remember Genesis chapter 3? I think we were just talking about this last week. God told Adam and Eve, you can eat of every, everything in the garden is yours. Make use of it. Eat of it. Enjoy it. Accept the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat from that tree. Because when you do, you're going to die. Eve had this little conversation with the Satan, the serpent. And what did the devil tell her? You won't die. You won't die. He's always doing that kind of thing. Jesus gives us something. God gives us something. The devil's job is to change it as far as he sees it. And so he's always trying to change what God and Jesus have taught us. Jesus says, except you believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. Incidentally, what if somebody's a really good Buddhist? A really good Buddhist, but they just don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What's going to happen to them? They're going to die in their sins. What if somebody <clears throat> is a really good Hindu, a really good Hindu, but they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God? What if they're a really good Muslim? Really good Muslim. I mean, there are Muslims who are good people, trustworthy individuals of character and dignity, but they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You know what the answer is, according to Jesus? They're going to die in their sin. Well, you know, that, that thins down the number of people who are going to heaven in this world, doesn't it? I don't want to thin it down. I want to thicken it up. To thicken it up, I want to preach to people about Jesus and tell them He is the Son of God. You need to believe in Him. Here's the reasons why I believe, and, and here are reasons why you should believe. Bring them to faith, because without faith in Jesus as the Son of God, we're going to die in our sins. So, that's where we'll start this morning. Anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus as the Son of God is going to die in their sins. If you look at Luke chapter 13... This is one place where Jesus talks about repentance. We've talked about believing that he's the Son of God. <clears throat> Here Jesus talks about repentance. Luke 13, verse 1. On the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans are greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish what's going to happen to those who don't repent they're going to die who said it Jesus said it if we say to the world like Jesus said to the world if you don't repent of your sin you're going to die are we being narrow minded this is what we must say we can't change this we have no authority to change it if we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, if he truly is our Lord, then we will follow our Lord. Which, you ever wonder why I ask the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then do not do the things that I say? Good question. If he is our Lord, we'll do what he says. We'll preach to the world, you need to repent. Not trying to be ugly, not trying to be hateful, not trying to be judgmental, trying to be accurate. He said it again in verse 4. Do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits? Don't you like that word, culprit? There's no positive way to talk about a culprit. How many of us are culprits? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we're here this morning. That's why we're going into the Word. That's why we're looking at this very idea about salvation because we know we are culprits and we desperately need a savior I tell you no verse 5 but unless you repent you will all likewise perish Jesus is addressing a simple truth that 
that works in humanity almost universally. We see something bad happen to somebody else and we think, ah, yeah, well, they deserved it. We might not even want to think that. We might want to think more graciously and lovingly, but we still think like that because we are just naturally humans and inclined to think like that. We can correct ourselves. I don't want to think like that, and that's the wrong way to think, and that's why I think Jesus is teaching us this, one of the reasons. Except we repent. We're all going to die. We are all culprits. We are all sinful, and we all need to have our sins absolved removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not a single person in the world that does not need that. And he's offering it us up to it all. But there are certain things that he says have to be true. Except you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what's going to happen to you? Oh, you won't die. Can you hear the devil saying that? You don't have to believe in Jesus. Even Christian Leaders, Christian, I say with the quotes, are pronouncing to the world that if you're a good, faithful Muslim, you can go to heaven. It's being said these days. Unless you repent, what's going to happen? It's going to die. When I think about this, I, I don't mean to be ugly or mean, but it's just I make these observations. I'm, I'm watching television sometimes and I see people on stage who are performing and the way they're performing and the way they're singing is often not very godly, not very Christian at all. And yet I see on them when the camera comes in a little closer, a great big cross. What does that cross proclaim to you? To me it proclaims, I'm telling you that I'm a Christian. Anybody who wears a cross telling you that they're a Christian. They are in line with the ideas of Christianity and they believe in Christianity and that cross to me proclaims they're proclaiming they're a Christian. And yet we see people wearing the cross but they never seem to repent. They seem to be living the same way that people would live if they were in the world and in fact that's what they're doing. I don't want to be ugly, I don't want to be hateful but Jesus said if there's no repentance all that's left is death. If you look at Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, so far we've talked about believing in Jesus. If you don't believe, you're going to die in your sins. If you don't repent, you're going to die. Who's going to heaven? Well, so far Jesus has said that those aren't, who aren't going to heaven are those who don't believe and those who don't repent. In Matthew chapter 10, we're talking about confession. Here he's sending out his apostles, his disciples really, there's 70 of them that are being sent out to preach the gospel. This is called the limited commission where he sent the, the disciples out to preach to Israel, to Judah. And so they're going out and he tells them, you're going to be persecuted when you go out, but don't worry about it. For example, look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. So they're going out to preach the gospel, but they're going to be persecuted for preaching the gospel. He says, don't worry. God knows. He's there. He's got the hairs of your head counted. He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows what's happening with you. He'll take care of you. So he says this in verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men... I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. If somebody says they believe in Jesus, but they never confess Jesus Christ? If you look at Luke chapter 9, I know we're, we're jumping all over the place here, but I want you to see that these things are in the scriptures, and Jesus is very specific about these. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says this, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus was sending them out to preach the gospel. They go out into the world, and the world is not 
welcoming the gospel. And so they're going to be persecuted. As often people who preach the word is, are persecuted today. And I don't know about you, I, I try to do a lot of preaching and teaching on Facebook. I've found I can reach a lot of people on Facebook. Now, I'm not telling you that people are coming to me in droves, but I'm telling you that people are hearing the word because it's an outlet. It's a street corner, so to speak. But I've had people say things to me on Facebook. Oh, yeah, you take your concordance and you just say whatever you want. Now, to me, to me, that's a compliment. Because when they mention concordance, that makes me think, oh, well, they know I'm quoting scripture. I'm not making this up. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll take that insult. I even had one young lady, not, not a member of this congregation, nobody knows her here, but I've known her from years gone by. She's, she's a Christian, a member of the Lord's church. And she said in one of her posts, oh, you believe in that book that was written thousands of years ago. How can that book be up to date is what that actually means. How can that book be accurate? How can you depend on that book and rely on that book? Now, we're not talking about pagan heathen folks from the world that have never been introduced to the gospel. We're talking about people who are members of the church who are saying things like this. And so Jesus says, I'm sending you out. And he was sending them out to Israel, to God's people. He says, you're going to be rejected and persecuted. But here's the deal. Anybody who's ashamed of me, who doesn't confess me, I will not confess him. Now, what does that mean to you with that picture of judgment in mind? Standing before the Father. And Jesus says, I will not confess this individual. Well, why won't you confess him, son? The father would ask, because he never confessed me. She never confessed me. If we don't believe in Jesus, what's going to happen to us? We're going to die in our sins. If we don't repent of our sins, what's going to happen to us? We're going to die. If we don't confess, Jesus will not confess us. And the result will be death. John chapter 3. Here's what I would say would be the next step, if you will. You want to call these steps. We know we've got to believe in Jesus. We've got to repent of our sin. We've got to confess Jesus. In John chapter 3, we're talking about the new birth, being born again through water and the Spirit. Chapter 3 of John, verse 1 says, There was a man in the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. Does that sound like an expression of faith to you? It does to me. Saying, we, we know you're from God. Nobody could do what you do unless you were from God. So he's already professed faith. Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I used to read this and think, boy, that's just kind of out of the blue, isn't it? Where'd that come from? No discussion about his ability to work miracles. No uh, acknowledgement of Nicodemus's powers of observation. Yes, you're very wise to have seen this and observed this. Very wise to put your faith in me. Jesus simply says, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus wasn't sure what he meant, so he asks, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And so Jesus says back to him in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, if you look at verse 3, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's going to happen if somebody's not born again? They will not see the kingdom of God. It's elementary. Jesus made it clear. Verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. If you don't see the kingdom of God, if you don't enter into the kingdom of God, doesn't that sound like you're lost? That's what it sounds like to me. Jesus is being extremely exclusive. And he prefaces his remarks with, both times, truly, 
truly, I'm not making this up. This isn't a pos possibility. This is a truly, truly statement. Unless you're born again, you don't see the kingdom. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you don't come into the kingdom. This is very exclusive. However, who does God want to come into the kingdom? Everybody. Ever. That's why he sent his son, for God so loved the world. He sent his son that we might believe in him. Now, I believe this is baptism. A lot of folks don't, but I do. I think it's pretty obvious. Born of water and the Spirit. If you look a little farther on in chapter 3 to verse 22, Jesus and his disciples are out in the countryside. What are they doing out in the countryside? They're baptizing people. You look at the beginning of chapter 4, the Apostle John writes that in the first two verses of chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more people than who? More people than John the baptizer. Why was John called the baptizer? Because he baptized so many people, and Jesus and his disciples were baptizing more. So when he says water in the Spirit, and then he says to the apostles, I think about Mark 16, 16, where he says, Go preach the gospel to all the nations, to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Is that what he said? That's what he said. Now you think about that. What if, what if Bill Gates came in here this morning and he said, You know, I'd like to give away a few million dollars. Anybody who believes that I'd like to give away a few million dollars and is willing to be baptized, I will give you a million dollars. Anybody argue about the baptism part? What if all the car dealers in, in Oklahoma City area got together and said, you know, if you'll come down here and, uh, and you'll believe that we'll do this, that we'll give you a free car, then if you'll just come down here and state that you believe that we'll do that and let somebody bury you in water, we'll give you a new car. Would you, would you go down there and ask, where's the water? Or would you go down there and argue with them? Well, I don't want to get wet, but I want a new car. That'd be kind of silly, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd let somebody dunk me again for a new car. Wouldn't you? I'd say, hello, Mr. Gates, where's the water? I wouldn't mind having one of your million dollars. Probably ruin me, but I'm willing to try. <laughs> but what wouldn't be an issue is what do I need to do to get a million dollars? And if I come up out of that water and I say, Mr. Gates, where's my million dollars? And he gives it to me, and then I walk out and say, where did you get that million dollars? I earned it. Well, how'd you earn a million dollars? I'll let some guy dunk me in water. What would they think of you? They'd think you're crazy. They'd think you're crazier if you didn't let him dunk you for the million. But they'd think you're crazy if you thought you earned a million dollars by letting somebody dunk you in water. No, I say dunk. Why do I say dunk? Because to a lot of people, that's what it looks like to them. But to those who know, Jesus is talking about a burial in water that it will in fact reenact what he is going to do and has done now for the salvation of the world. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's why Paul writes that when he writes to the church in Rome. And he writes to them about what they've already done. Don't you know that as many of you as were buried in Christ have been baptized into his death in baptism? So you can rise to walk in newness of life. Jesus says, except you're born again, you're not coming into the kingdom. Now, if you and I go out to the world and people say, oh, you think you're the only ones going to heaven, and we ask them, well, have you been born again by water and the Spirit? And they say no. What can we say to them? You're not in the kingdom. I'm sorry. I want you to be in the kingdom. I want to tell you about this so you say, oh, I do need to be born again. Somebody says, I want one of Bill Gates' millions. I'm going to tell him, hey, he said if you'll just go down there and tell him that you'll believe that he'll give you a million and then let somebody bury you in water for that, then you'll get a million dollars. I want, I want you to know about that. Wouldn't you tell me, wouldn't you call me up and say, hey, Marty, guess what Bill Gates said? Guess what all the car dealers in Oklahoma City said? You want a new car? It's really pretty easy, isn't it? But people argue and they fuss about that, just like the devil Oh, you won't die. You don't have to do that. You don't have to abide by that. In Luke chapter 9, let's finish this up. There's so much more we could say about these things. But what it comes down to is this. 
anybody who does what Jesus Christ says they need to do to be saved, they are saved. Anybody who refuses to do what Jesus Christ says they need to do to be saved is lost. That's all I'm saying. Do we think we're the only ones going to heaven? I don't usually answer that question with a yes or a no. I usually answer it with a question. So what did Jesus say? And that's really all that matters. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 57 with me. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said this, and this imagery, it just sticks in my mind. He said, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. What's that mean? That means if you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you repent of your sin like he taught us to do, and you confess him openly and publicly, that means if someone buries you in water so that you experience the new birth by water in the Spirit of God, that it's not over yet. There's a faithfulness that must be lived out. And when we give up that faithfulness in Christ, we give up the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying here. You put your hand to the plow, but you look back, that you're not fit. You're not fit. Well, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? But when you think about that, what would, be, what would we be looking back to? Looking back to this world, looking back to our sin, looking back to the, the pleasures we enjoyed based on our lust? And what would we, we be looking away from? God, who spoke the universe into existence, has, has sent his own son to live here for 33 years and to, to die a horrible death to buy us out of sin. We see that, we acknowledge that, and then after enjoying that salvation, we look back. You know what Peter said about that, don't you remember? He said it's like a dog returning to its vomit. I remember as a, as a young boy, I had a beautiful little dog. It was a whippet. Anybody know what a whippet is? It's kind of a cross between a collie and a greyhound. It's like a short-haired, uh, beautiful collie, fast, very fast. I mean, she could... And when she would run, she was just a straight line above the ground like this. Zing! Couldn't even see her legs, like in the cartoons. Zoom! She was fast. Beautiful little dog. She barfed one day. And I remember just about barfing myself when I saw her go back to it. And I think about that when I read this. And when I read what Peter said about dogs returning to their vomit and sows returning to being to the mire once they've been washed. At any rate, do I think I'm the only one going to heaven? Well, no. I think anybody who does the things that the scriptures teach is going to heaven. But that's the question. Have the people who are asking us the question done these things? Usually they haven't. Usually they haven't. And they seem to be saying, as the devil said, it's all right. You won't die. You won't die. Sometimes I want to say, will you just wait till Judgment Day? And then I think, what a cruel thing to say. But part of me wants to say that you just wait. You're going to get yours. Remember what Jesus said to the apostles? They were going through Samaria, and the Samaritans turned them out and said, we don't want you coming through here because you're going to Jerusalem. And they said, can we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So the next time somebody asks you that question, somebody confronts you and affronts you, oh, you think you're one of those ones going to heaven. 
Remember to love them. Remember to have the spirit of grace and mercy towards them. And to know that except for the grace of God, that could be you on the other side asking that dumb question. Making that dumb statement. Love them. Teach them. Show them. Be Jesus Christ to them because you may be the only gospel they ever see or they ever hear. Well, that's the end of this sermon. We'll, uh, we'll wrap this up and we'll slide on home in a little while. But before we do, if, if you are not a member of the Lord's church, if you're not part of the kingdom, if you haven't believed in Jesus but you've come to believe in him and you're, you're ready to repent of your sin and confess his name and let somebody bury you in water so that you can experience the new birth by water and the spirit, we want to do that for you because we think you're one of those people that wants to put your hand to the plow and keep on plowing. If that's what you want to do or if there's any other way we can help you this morning, Come on down front and we'll help you while we sing the invitation song together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time we've come here today, and Father, for the safety on the roads to get here. Father, just be with us as we, we leave, keep us safe. And Father, we're so thankful for Marty and his abilities and the lesson he brought today, and Father, uh, Father, we know that it's not man who decides to go to heaven, who gets to go to heaven, it's you, and you spelled it out so simple for us in your word. Father, just help us to, to stick to your word and, and follow it and 
Father, to uh, tell others about your word and to help them uh, be able to, to enter your kingdom someday, Father. Like I said, please go with us. Bless us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name.